Software as Vice President of Marketing. I would like to welcome everyone to today's What's New in 4.403 webinar. Before I introduce today's presenter, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Because of the number of attendees that we have logged on to the webinar, everyone's phones will stay on mute. If you have any questions during the webinar, please enter them in the question window that you see on the lower right of your screen. We'll try to answer everyone's questions towards the end of the webinar. If we're unable to get to everyone's questions, we'll follow up with everyone individually after the webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded. As soon as the recording is available, we'll send everyone a message to let them know that the recording as well as the presentation slides are available to be, to be downloaded on the customer content page of our website. On that note, I would like to introduce Chris Lamagne, our VP of Technology, to give you an overview of what's new in our upcoming 4.4, excuse me, 4.4.0.3 uh, release. Thanks. Chris, it's all yours. Thanks, Tom. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I really hope you guys are having the kind of weather we're having here. Um, it's just beautiful outside. I keep looking at the news and seeing that um, everybody's having heat waves and uh, it's really, really uh, miserable where everybody, are, everybody is. My parents live in Colorado and I think the whole state's on fire right now. And uh, I recently uh, told them, hey, come on out and visit us. Uh, we've got the air conditioning on for the entire city of Portland. So um, uh, if any of you guys are looking for a place to hide from the heat, come on out here and, uh, and drop by DM2 and visit with us. So as Tom said, um, my name is Chris Lamagne. I'm the Vice President of Technology for DM2 Software. I'm more or less the alpha geek for DM2. I run the technical uh, groups, which are the support group, the programming group, and the quality assurance group. Um, I have the privilege today to talk about um, our latest release of software. Uh, DM2 comes out with a release uh, every so often, a, a new version. Um, Tom was talking about the version numbers. And I, I want to take a second, for those of you who don't know, uh, and talk to you about how the versions of DM2 work. Um, DM2, of course, is built on top of uh, the world-class mid-range accounting system, Sage Software's Sage 100. And we uh, it used to be called MASS 90 or MASS 200. It's now called Sage 100. Um, yes, te technically, Chris, it's Sage ERP 100, and that basically includes 90, the old 90 and 200 versions together under that umbrella. There you go. Um, so that's uh, so. We're just trying to get you guys used to the new names, uh, using them in, in different places. But our version numbers represent the first set of digits are the Sage platform number. So in this case, Tom mentioned 4.40.3. Um, our last one was 4.40.2. So basically, what it is is the third release of DM2 on Sage's 4.4 platform. That's how you think about it. So these are major releases for DM2, uh, but we haven't changed the Sage platform underneath. So when the Sage platform rolls to whatever the next version is, 4.5, 4.6, 5.0, whatever it is, then that first number will change. So I just like to share that so people understand how, we, uh, how we're labeling it and what you're looking at. So without further ado, let's uh, move on and look at some stuff. All right, first, great, Chris, thanks. Say again? I said great, Chris, thanks. OK, thanks, Tom. Um, as, we, uh, as we move forward to the presentation, the very first thing I wanted to do was to talk a little bit about our last release. In case that for those of you who didn't have a chance to attend last uh, time's webinar, and the other thing I know is that um, there were some technical difficulties, which I believe we've actually been able to overcome, uh, where it didn't get recorded. So I just wanted to mention some things uh, about what that release contained, and, uh, and just to let you know, because these releases are relatively close together. So a lot of you who may be up in the upgrade process or getting ready to sign up for the upgrade process uh, will probably, if you were signing up today, for instance, would end up with 4.4.3, which would also build on 4.4.2's feature set. So I just wanted to give a quick overview. So back in April, that's when this came out, uh, the very first thing we added was a bank reconciliation payment type interface. Um, in sales order, when you put in a payment, a payment in there, uh, traditionally, it didn't flow up to bank reconciliation automatically. We added an enhancement to make it do that. So if you've applied a payment inside of the actual sales order, that payment flows directly to bank rec. 
We added support for the Pacific Pride T6 format uh, and support for the NACS product codes. Um, most people that are affected by that by now are uh, in the queue and they're getting the updates, uh, but it is a standard part of the 4.4.2 release that came out in April. Uh, a delayed card lock in, uh, inventory costing. This is basically uh, a feature in the software that causes card lock to hold back its transactions relieving inventory until after the bill of ladings have been updated uh, to give you a more accurate costing set for those card lock transactions. Uh, Pacific Pride concurrent fueling support. There was a problem um, that Pacific Pride was dealing with where people were stealing product from card lock, uh, card lock operators by enabling two pumps kind of simultaneously, so concurrent fuel. So they disabled that ability, so basically the system would only allow one pump to operate from a card swipe at a time. Uh, that created problems for people who legitimately were fueling two different uh, vehicles. So what uh, they have added back is the control for you to be able to actually uh, enable that or disable it on a customer by customer, card by card basis. So we've uh, added support to our maintenance for that. Hey, Chris, there's one thing I think it's important for everybody to realize with that uh, T6 format and NAX product code support that we put in there. That gives uh, Pacific Pride marketers the ability to take the new universal card that Pride's starting to roll out. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that for everyone. Good point. I live in the uh, geek realm, so I think a lot about what specifically we changed. So thanks for, thanks for clarifying that. Sure, no problem. Um, our blending and repackaging mod module has been moved into the new framework architecture. We've been talking a lot about framework over the last couple of years. That's the new uh, back end of, uh, of the Sage 100 system. And we are moving all of our modules up, and, uh, and blending and packaging was the most recent. So it has a new look and feel. It has the new screen types. It has the crystal-based reports, all the things you've heard about uh, if you've attended one of our webinars before. Um, we are currently deep into uh, a couple of other modules, fuel tax, bill of lading, and working on card lock. So those things are progressing towards framework completion, and uh, we're very excited about that. So, but blending and repackaging is available in 4.4.2 as a framework module. Um, we had an issue where people were putting in uh, one-step bill of ladings. These are bill of ladings where they don't have a sales order, but they're going to do an S distribution, and that sales order was tied into a dispatch uh, schedule or ticket. So you were actually fulfilling a tank delivery from a one step and creating that through bill of lading, not through dispatch scheduler. So we needed to add the ability to, for you to be able to uh, put on a ticket class onto that sales order, so we've added that functionality. Uh, freight follows item tax class. Uh, basically there was a need for uh, freight, the way freight works is that freight has its own inventory item and it has its own sales tax class and its own excise tax class that goes along with it, um, the item has its own tax class. And what we found is that the petroleum marketers really wanted the freight, uh, optionally, the freight to follow the item's tax class. So whatever the item tax class was, the fuel tax, uh, a, a TX class, a non-taxable, all those kind of things, freight would go right along with it. So that's a new uh, user configurable option. Uh, fuel price table purge utility, we didn't have an easy way to remove old pricing records from the pricing table, so we uh, added an enhancement so you guys can do that yourselves. We had some back-end tools that our support could help you with, but now we've made that a standard feature in the software. Uh, along with it is a fuel price import. We found that a lot of customers, a lot of you guys out there, were getting pricing from something other than one of our standard uh, import systems. The standards would be things like DTN. DT, we have a fully automated DTN price import, but some people, some customers are using spreadsheets or they're using some other system um, and they wanted to be able to easily get the pricing to come in through some sort of interface. You could use Visual Integrator to do it, but it could be kind of tricky. So we now include a standard fuel price import uh, with a defined file layout that it expects. And as long as you match that layout, you can import from anything that can create that file. So it's just a, a comma-separated file that could come from Excel or it could come from a third-party system or wherever you get your fuel prices from. Uh, we have the ability now for DTN dealer credit cards to split the fees for those transactions. 
We added uh, the ability, while, while we were in adding purges, we added an Outbox purge. So these are for documents that have already been transmitted from Outbox. We keep them in history for a little bit so that you can see if they went or if you need to resend them, they're in there. We've now added a user level purge utility, uh, so you can just kick those out. And a new consign stations module. This, is a, this was a feature we added to the software. It's a brand new module uh, to allow you to work with consign stations. And if you're not familiar with that, that would be where you have your inventory uh, out at, for instance, the C store, and they don't actually own the inventory you do, so it's your inventory out there. And then you're, they're selling it and reporting back to you uh, how many gallons were sold, that kind of stuff. So then you can decide how much commission you're going to pay them um, or work out some sort of arrangement. And this automates that process and does include a web portal uh, for those consignees to use. So the consignees can actually log into the Internet, go to your web portal, and go in and make their entry. So they don't have to mail documents in or those kinds of things. It can all be done just after. And after they enter it, we take care of all the tank inventory levels and everything that needs to go on there. So that completes the 4.4.2 uh, release that we had come out in April. And uh, we're very proud of what we did there. But now we're moving on. We're going to move on and take a look at 4.4.3, um, which is the newest release that we're really, take, we're really uh, excited about having it come out. And um, take you through some of the features there, talk about some of the new things. Uh, there's always a lot of things, but I try and pick out a few that uh, kind of give you a flavor for where we've been focusing our efforts and uh, in things I, may, I think you may find interesting. So let's take a look at some of the new stuff. The first thing is we added truck and driver fields to the bill of lading entry. What we found is that more and more, uh, the, as you guys are becoming more and more and more sophisticated, uh, we needed to respond. We needed to uh, create some new tools in the software to help you accomplish some of the things you're wanting to do. And one of them is to be able to look at truck and driver performance. Um, we didn't really have a clean way to, to capture that data, especially if you didn't use dispatch scheduler. Uh, dispatch scheduler had the concept of trucks and drivers, but the standard software did not. Um, so if you didn't have what we call the PD module, the dispatch schedule module, you couldn't really put that data in easily. So we received a lot of custom requests over the last few years to add those fields uh, that we had done at a custom level. So we decided to make that a standard feature in the software. So the enhancement enables the entry of a truck and driver during the bill of lading entry. So the, the truck that went out and picked up the fuel and the driver that was driving the vehicle, uh, you, the capture of the information should allow for enhanced productivity reporting. We pass it from the top of the system all the way through. So after it's captured a data entry, it does flow all the way into our data warehouse. So the first thing we had to do was we had to deal with the fact that um, it was all dependent on dispatch scheduler. So what we did was we took the driver code maintenance functionality out of dispatch scheduler and put it into Petrolink. Uh, Petrolink is our standard sort of core module that everything runs off of. Um, so it used to be in dispatch scheduler, but now is, is available for customers who don't own the dispatch scheduler module. But if you did use the dispatch scheduler module, the drivers are automatically moved here during your upgrade. So you don't have to rekey them or reset them up if you're using dispatch scheduler, and it works the same way it did before. It's just the maintenance is now part of Petrolink instead of being in PD. The truck codes are still maintained in the ship via maintenance under sales order setup, so there's no change there. Um, that they've always been maintained as, as shipping via locations, and uh, and we kept that same structure with the new uh, the new truck and driver. So during the bill of lading entry, we wanted you to have the ability to default an entire batch to a particular truck and driver to ease data entry. We didn't want you to have to necessarily go through and key in truck and driver. Uh, for each one of the bills of ladings unless you wanted to, unless they really were on different trucks and drivers. So when you start a bill of lading invoice batch, you can go in, specify the truck and the driver. There are lookups just like most of the fields in, in Sage have. It's a validated field. Um, the, uh, and this will automatically assign that truck and driver to each bill of lading in the batch. Uh, so it works as the default, if you want to think about it like that, and automatically populates. In the bill of lading entry itself, uh, you can override those defaults. So once you've started entering your bill of ladings, uh, you can go down the, in the bottom right, you'll see a little green box around a button that says Petrolink. 
So if you click that Petrolink button, you're given the opportunity to override those fields with whatever you want to put in there. Now, if the Petrolink button is pressed, then you get this uh, Petrolink options screen you can see at the top here, and you specify your truck and driver IDs. Now, with the addition of that into the bill of lading to more standardize that setup and allow you to be able to access that and apply it to existing sales orders uh, and use it without dispatch scheduler uh, directly through bill of lading, we actually had provided the capability of filling in a couple fields in sales order if you were doing a one step. So if you're in bill of lading and you were creating a sales order using a one step, you can see that screen on the bottom right. We had a couple fields there, one called the ship via and one the FOB. And we allowed you to fill those fields in. And the way people used them was for trucks and drivers. So the ship via truck or the FOB would be the driver. We now handle that through the bill of lading header. So those fields have been removed and no longer have to be tabbed through or entered uh, when you're putting in the sales order distribution. So that truck and driver data then flows into history, uh, into the history files, and is available for reporting and analysis to the DM2 SQL warehouse. So if you're using um, uh, ex our, our data warehouse that runs in Excel, this data will show up, and you're able then to use it for any kind of analytics uh, you want to do. Uh, they're tied to each one of the invoices, so you can actually pull all that data in and look at it by invoice or by groups of invoices, by customers, by trucks and drivers, any way you want to slice and dice it. Uh, I do want to make a note that these fields are required, so you cannot update the bill of ladings without the truck and driver being entered. So just be aware of that as you move forward, that you do need to put them in. We think with the batch header, uh, it shouldn't be burdensome for people who don't have a lot of trucks and drivers. They can just set up one of each uh, and then move on down the road. But uh, we felt that it needed to be in there, and we're building some back-end stuff into some of our analytics that will be depending on it. So we wanted to make sure that that was a required field. So the next thing I want to talk about is several features we added to freight. Um, as we've discovered over the years that uh, there, were, there were things about our freight that was weak and we wanted to go back and shore up and, and get it really uh, running uh, effectively, efficiently, and automatically. There's still a lot of manual things that had to be done, so we tried to go back and add some features in to clean that up and to make it uh, a little easier to work with and support some of the new things you guys are doing. So the first of, of those items was a bill of lading date effective surcharges. So basically the enhancement is aimed at allowing better control of freight surcharges. Instead of going to the accounts payable vendor maintenance, which is where you used to put this in, We've added it, actually added it over into the freight rate maintenance screen, and it's based on dates. So previously, you could only have one rate at a time tied out to the AP. So you could end up in a situation where you had to work through all of the APs for a particular common carrier, all the, all of the legs for a particular common carrier, to get that appropriate freight rate surcharge that was on a particular date, then go back, change that rate, and actually go through and rerun the, rerun the next group that's on a different date. Obviously, if cumbersome, it works, but it's, it's not really elegant. So it, as I was saying, in previous versions, you can see in this vendor maintenance screen, there was a field called freight surcharge. That's where you would put it in. There could be only rate, one rate. And when the rate was going to change, the user had to make sure the rate was set properly for the current BOLs and then process. Then you change the rate and then process the next set of BOLs, and it was a pretty cumbersome way to do it. So what we've done is we've gone into bill of lading and added a new button to freight rate maintenance. So when you go in and you put in your carrier and you're going to set up all of your freight, you're, most of you are pretty familiar with the screen. Um, you can go and put your sequence numbers in, your, your regular uh, freight amounts, all those kinds of things. But now you can click a little button that says freight surcharge. You can see it's highlighted in green, kind of up in the right. And you'll get this screen. And what you can do is then go in and put in your effective date and enter the surcharge. So you can go ahead and put in for different dates, and the system will automatically take care of applying the appropriate uh, freight, freight surcharge amount as the bill ladings are going in. So in this particular case, the freight surcharge rate is based on the BO pickup date. So whatever date it has in the bill of lading, it's going to use that surcharge or up to that date. Uh, and if there are bill of ladings with different pickup dates in the batch, then it will pull the appropriate surcharge rate. Uh, in each bill of lading itself will pick up those dates. So even though you're mixing them in the same batch, 
They can have different pickup dates. That will select whatever the appropriate surcharge is. So that was one thing we wanted to do to try and make that a little easier to deal with, especially now where everybody is squeezing margins and trying to get as much uh, coverage for their costs as possible. We wanted to make sure we had a, a clean way of doing that for you. A lot more intuitive place to have that, too. Exactly, exactly. So the next, uh, yeah, Tom makes a good point there. It was We also found that you were having to go to two different places when you're thinking of total freight cost. Um, you're going over to AP and setting up part of it and then going over to freight maintenance and setting up part of it, and it didn't make sense. So we put it all in one place and, and cleaned that up. Gives you a better way to see what's going on. So the next thing is uh, freight in handled as freight out for cost of goods sold. So we wanted to find a way to actually have the freight flow into the cost of goods sold, uh, the freight in anyway, uh, out to that cost of goods sold to give you uh, even more accurate gross gross margins. Um, we always want to make sure, you know, accurate gross margins, the system has incredibly accurate gross margins. But sometimes you have to do some monkeying around to make sure you get, account you get accounted for everything that you want to have in there. Um, so well, one of the things we've been doing as an initiative is going through and finding places where we could do things to automate stuff that some people are doing manually. So they may be making GL entries or changing things to really make sure they're capturing it all. So we wanted to enhance the system, provide that. So now that freight in flows out as cost of goods sold. So the purpose of the enhancement is to handle and display freight in as a cost of goods sold for the associated freight out entry. Um, this is reflected in SO invoice, in the gross profit reports, the history, the sales debt analysis tools, and the profit link files. So we're putting the cost into the freight item that's actually being charged out to the customer. So you're getting a true gross profit on the freight item itself. Um, it is only applied to S-type transactions that are not that are not distributed to internal customers. So that's very important. And so it's sales order sales orders going out to customers that have freight on them, but not internal transfers. So what we did uh, to turn it on is there's been a new flag added to the bill of lading options. It's called post freight in to freight out cost of goods sold. It's defaulted to off and will need to be turned on to enable the functionality. Um, if the flag is unchecked, the freight in is added to the cost of the associated fuel items when updating bills of lading and inventory. So that's just the standard functionality uh, that it does today. But if you check the box, and I didn't, couldn't find really a better way to say this because it all kinds of happens behind the scenes, but for, uh, for you uh, accounting types out there, uh, if the flag is turned on, then the following flows through. So if, if it's an I-type or an inventory transaction, so that's a distribution to inventory, uh, they're not affected by this. If it's an internal transfer between two of your locations, it's not affected by this. But if it's an S-type transaction, then this is what you're going to get. Uh, when the bill of lading daily transaction register is updated, you get a debit to inventory for product, a debit to inventory for freight, and a credit purchases clearing for the supplier and a credit purchases clearing for the carrier. Then on the daily transaction register for sales orders, you get a credit sales for product, a credit sales for freight, you get a credit inventory for product, a credit inventory for freight, and a debit cost of goods sold for product freight and a debit to accounts receivable. So the idea is, like I said, to capture that cost uh, and get it pushed into those freight, to that freight item so that you can get those better gross margins and a more accurate view of how you're doing financially. So the DM, one of DM2's big initiatives and one of the things we work very hard and have for, for our history, for our 20 plus years history, is to, we, we know that gross profit is, is really what you're running your business on. And, you guys are looking at that daily, you definitely don't want to have to wait till a, a bunch of things happen to be able to see what it is. So we're trying constantly to get the gross profit reports, get the analysis to happen as real time as possible, and that drives a lot of these kinds of enhancements we make to the software. Another thing we did with freight is uh, we created an option to apply freight based on gross gallons. So this is an enhancement that creates an option for customers who want to base freight calculations on the gross. So some, usually if you have net, uh, you're selling at net, you calculate the, the actual freight on the net quantity. But in some parts of the United States, the standard is to always handle freight based on the gross gallon, even when you're selling at net. So we needed to add some functionality in there to be able to handle that. Uh, and this feature allows you to decide if the calculation, how the calculation should be handled. So we've added another new flag. Uh, into the bill of lading options. 
The, uh, it's called the freight based on gross gallons. It is defaulted to off and will need to be turned on to enable the functionality. Uh, a little sidebar here, one of the things DM2 does is to ease upgrades. Whenever we add new features like this, we try to default them to not change the behavior you're used to. You're already, with an upgrade, going to a new version like 4.4.3, you're already drinking from a little bit of a fire hose. You're retraining people, you're learning new screens, you're taking advantage of new capabilities, uh, all those kinds of things. The last thing you want to do is have the system act funny uh, because we, did, we made a change to the way the data flows. So what we do is we try and default these things to off, and that's kind of why I'm making this point, so that when you come out of upgrade, your operation is still working the same way. Then our consulting group and our, and our team can work with you, our upgrade team can work with you on telling you what the ramifications are of turning these switches on, and then helping you through that process. So at some point, these will probably become just enabled on, but that's how DM2 approaches it. We try and be a little conservative. Uh, we always say we want you on the bleeding edge. I'm sorry, on the leading edge, not the bleeding edge. So we try to be conservative here and have the system work as close to the way you're used to after upgrade as it did before, but provide these new features. So if the flag is unchecked, the freight in is added to the cost associated fuel items when you updated the bill of lading. All right, if the freight on gross gallons flag in bill of lading options is unchecked, the freight is calculated based on the settings for that vendor pickup point item in bill of lading product maintenance. If the freight on gross gallons flag in bill of lading is checked, freight is calculated based on gross gallons regardless of the setting for that vendor point item in bill of lading product maintenance. The functionality calculates based on gross gallons for all types of bill of lading entries, internal vendor, customer, I type, as well as S type. So inventory, internal inventory, sales order distributions, or an internal transfer. So what it's doing is you are you may have it set to do net for your distribution in this screen. No, I don't have a screenshot here, but um, it may be uh, actually I do. So in in this particular screen, if you have your post gross or net to IM and SO turned on to net, but you have the option unchecked, then it will just flow and follow this particular setting. So it will follow exactly the way it normally works. It will do the post in net and it will actually do the freight calculation in net if that's how it was set net net or gross gross depending on how you set it and that's down here in the in this bottom part so if the freight on gross gallons flag and bill lighting options is checked so if you turn on that checkbox then the freight is calculated based on gross gallons regardless of the settings there um, and that's actually going to be you know that's system wide but it will do that calculation on gross regardless of whether you're doing net or you do what's called a net override. So it will always calculate on gross. So just want to be real clear on that. So it is a, it is a system-wide kind of thing and will override the product maintenance for any of those that are set up that way. So all of your freight will end up going out gross. The next thing is a net distribution override. So this is another uh, enhancement to the, to the bill of lading system uh, that we've, we've run into quite a bit, which is uh, allowing you to override the, uh, even though a system is set to distribute gross, you actually want this particular bill of lading to be distributed net. So the same kind of setup area we've been talking about, but we wanted to bring it down to the granularity of the bill of lading. So, what I said here was this enhancement allows an option for customers who want to override the bill of lading product maintenance default post the IM and SO setting so it is net. The option is bill of lading specific. So in the, in the setup, which we just looked at for, uh, for the gross gallons for freight, in the bill of lading product maintenance, there is a post gross or net to IM and SO, and in this case, it's set to gross. Um, this reflects the gross net options for IM and SO is the, and is set in the default as the default for this supplier and pickup point. In the past, this couldn't be overridden in bill of lading. So basically, you would set this to post gross net to IM and SO for that supplier and that pickup. Then as you, pro as you process your bill of lading, it would always post whatever option was chosen here, gross, to flow up to inventory and sales order. But there are situations where a particular bill of lading should be posted net net. And uh, it, it can be regional issue. It can be a type of customer you're working with. Uh, but we needed to have a bill of lading level override. So what we did is in bill of lading, we added a new checkbox at the header level. It's highlighted in green, kind of towards the center of the screen. 
If the checkbox is left unchecked, the bill of lading will follow the default. So it will behave just like you're used to and follow what, so once you're doing your upgrade, it will just continue to work the way it always has if you don't do anything with that field. If it's checked, then all bill of lading journals, inventory registers, sales order journals, daily transactions registers will display the net distributed quantity as if, as if the default was set to net for IM and SO. And the history reports will also reflect the net amount. So basically, if for that particular bill of lading, will flow through the entire system into history as, as a net net, rather than gross gross or gross net or however you have it set up. So that's that kind of closes up some enhancements we've made for bill of lading, especially those freight enhancements. Like I said, we recognize that more and more uh, freight is a big deal. Uh, more and more the expense of operating your trucks is a big deal. Uh, as the margins get slim, you're, you know, you're looking for those efficiencies. So we wanted to provide some reporting enhancements. We wanted to provide some freight and surcharge enhancements, uh, provide some, some better analytics for cost of goods sold. Uh, to capture that freight, that freight information a little quicker, and really round that out. So we think it's a really good uh, set of features added in to round out the freight system and, and round out bill of lading in general and bring some new functionality and really make the whole operation a little easier to work with. So the next thing uh, is ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil's interface is called PEGMOST. Most people know it as the PEGMOST interface. Uh, ExxonMobil system is called Stripes. It's a new uh, back-end system that they're using. And we needed to update ExxonMobil uh, in the PEGMOS interface to use that new Stripes uh, logic, that new Stripes interface. So this enhancement basically adjusts the layout of the existing PEGMOS export program to match the new layout created by ExxonMobil, which has been rebranded as Stripes. Uh, the enhancement only applies to the export program. However, uh, there is some other things that have to be done, including changes to their mobile product codes, as well as distributor account numbers and buyback account numbers, uh, which have been rebranded as national ship to number. Uh, if you are a user of PEGMOS and ExxonMobil, um, we have probably contacted you already and are either scheduled or are working with you currently to bring your current version up to support this, as well as it's a standard function now inside of the 4.4.3 release, the standard, uh, standard capability. The next thing uh, is a sales category field for the sales debt. Uh, sales debt is actually what we call uh, a, a table that get exported through the DM2 SQL data warehouse that contains a lot of information from invoice history, from bill of lading, from inventory. It brings it all into one place, into one view that makes it easier to work with. And, uh, and that table is called sales debt. So the system automatically populates that table on a cycle that you set using our SQL interface. And then you can tie into it using Excel or whatever tools you have that can work with SQL. And then you can manipulate that data. And we can assist you with setting those kinds of things up. So if you're not taking advantage of this, I would really recommend that you contact our consulting group and have somebody work with you on using uh, the sales debt and our SQL interface in general. Uh, however, what we did was We've added some new data into the DM2 SQL Data Warehouse. Specifically, it adds a new column titled Sales Category. So we have some settings that we can work with you to set up. And when building the sales debt spreadsheet, the sales debt records, uh, the system compares prior year to determine if there was new business, retained business, or a share of wallet business for given purchases. So it actually can categorize your sales saying whether this is existing sales, in other words, you've sold something to a customer that you sold stuff to last year, so it's just retainage business. You sold something to a brand new customer, or it's, they're buying something new, something different than they used to buy, so there's new business, or you're, I'm sorry, they're, they're a brand new customer, or they're buying something different than they used to, and you're getting a bigger share of their wallet business. So this is bringing some intelligence into analyzing that data and coming back with some, some more information so you can actually look at how you're doing with retaining customers, getting new business, and getting a larger piece of their spending on petroleum products and whatever they buy from you. It spits it out into our sales debt tables, and then it's available through Excel. I put a little screenshot up there of this. And you can see that in this case, SOW share a wallet, retain, or new. And it's telling us what's going on with those customers, or, you know, where we're, how we're doing. It also gives you a good metric of how your sales force is doing. Are you getting you know, if your initiative is to get new customers, well, you'd want to see a lot of new here. 
if, you're, if your initiative is to retain your customers, you can see retains, and then share of wallet, your salespeople are out there getting a larger piece of their wallet. So you can set goals for those different areas that you want to work toward, capture it here to get your actuals and see how you're doing, performance to plan. So a real nice feature. Uh, we're pretty excited about it. And there is some customization in the setup that we can work with you on to make it be a little smarter about your business specifically. Chris, before you move on, I just want to mention uh, last month we had a business intelligence basics webinar that focused heavily on the SQL data warehouse reporting feature. So if, uh, if you didn't get a chance to see that webinar, you can go to our website and download the recording. Uh, but it really ties into what Chris just talked about there with sales debt enhancements. Thanks, Tom. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is the addition of a ship time field. So what does that mean? Uh, with more and more interday price changes, the system needed to be enhanced to support ship time as well as the date. So when you're, the way the system was working before, it would use whatever the current price was at the time that order was processed, uh, even though the ship time might actually be something in the future or it may have been earlier. Um, but it used whatever the most current was. We've now added the ability in sales order and invoice to actually say what time it went as well as the date. So you can enter the ship time that's used in conjunction with the ship date to derive the correct table price uh, that should be used for pricing orders and invoices. So it gives you a interday granularity in your setup of how your pricing is calculated. So there's a new button that's been added to sales order uh, and sales order invoice data, sales order entry and invoice data entry to allow your operators to enter the ship time as well as the ship date. You can see the little green box. There's like a button that looks like a clock next to the date. When a new order or invoice is entered, the ship date is automatically set to the current date. That's no change. It always did that. And the ship time is defaulted to 0001. So that will behave pretty much the way it's always behaved in the past. So like, we said, like I said, when, when it's upgrading, uh, it won't radically change the behavior until you decide to take advantage of it. If you press the time button, uh, it displays a place for you to enter the time of the delivery. If the user changes the ship date, the ship time automatically defaults to 001 and the window pops open. So if you override the date, it will automatically pop that field up for you to put in the ship time. To ease that data entry, uh, it will automatically close if you press enter or tab. So when an operator is going through, you probably know this uh, from using the system, uh, most of the time, you're, even though a mouse is great, you're trying to do most of it with your keyboard controls. So you're tabbing through fields, you're using the Alt key to select folders, that kind of thing. And so when this comes up, you can dismiss it just by pressing the Enter or the Tab button and tab right out of it. So you don't have to take your hand off the keyboard and press the OK button or anything like that. We tried to make it as simple as possible uh, so that you didn't have to add another layer or another step there. So that ship time then is used to actually calculate the, that time is taken into account with the date to calculate what the pricing should be. If you change that time, each line on the order will recalculate automatically unless the price has been overridden. So you've got an easy way to say it needed to go at a later time or ship later in the day or shipped earlier in the day. You can get a really granular price from your price tables. Next um, is the access interfaces. For a long time, um, you know, we, we always talk about how we're always looking to partner with best of breed and partner and let our customer base drive the kinds of things that we do. And one of the things we're getting more and more requests for was adding some access uh, connection to the software uh, for f functionality or add that as an add-on so you guys could, could act, if you're using access instead of DTN or something else, uh, you could get the same kind of robustness you would see with a DTN interface. So what we did was we added some support for importing from Access. The interface supports the fuel price tables, bills of lading, AR credit cards, AP vendor invoices, and the manual checks, uh, which would be like vendor EFTs. So these five new interfaces are available uh, to tie directly into Access. We worked in a partnership with Access to develop them, and, um, uh, and those are available now with a 4.4.3 release. So there's a new menu option in Petrolink for Access Import Interface. You can see here the, the five different options of what you can pull in. We have uh, first the fuel pricing import, 
which is uh, all you have to do is specify the pricing file that you want. In this case, it's just a CSV. The system recognizes it as an access file. Uh, you can choose audit only or import fuel prices. If you've ever used one of our other uh, online interface systems, you're familiar with this process. But uh, you can do an audit where you're just looking at what's going to be changed, and then you can apply the import to actually bring the prices in. We added a credit card transaction import to bring over uh, credit cards in the system. You just select the file from the dropdown. Uh, you specify the bank code for the cash receipts that you want to have it go in. And then there is a button for dealer maintenance if these are dealer credit cards. And you can go in and put in the dealer location numbers, the AR customer cross-reference numbers, uh, percentage of fee if you're doing fee breakdowns, where the fee is supposed to go for general ledger, what type of credit card it is. So all the information you need for that dealer credit card uh, to come in, and that can all be brought in from Access. We have AP invoice import, which is the vendor or product import. So this is the, the vendor product stuff. You just select the file to be converted. Uh, you can specify a variance tolerance. Basically, a lot of times the invoices will slightly be different than what you may have gotten on your bill of lading. Uh, usually just a rounding error or a rounding issue where it will be just off slightly. You, if you are, want to, you can go in and say, if the lower limb, if there's tolerance of zero and I want it to be precise, then it will kick them out and you have to go in and correct them and make sure that everything's right, um, make sure it's the way you want it. If you know that you have a tolerance of, let's say, plus or minus a dollar or something like that, then you can say, I have a lower limit of a dollar, upper limit of a dollar, and then whatever GL account you want that to go to. And what the system will do is balance it. It will add the, initial, the extra GL entry uh, inside the AP invoice import to make sure that those things balance. So if you have a tolerance for it being off just a few pennies or whatever, then you can set that here instead of having to, to deal with all that. But that's your choice and how you want to set it up. Uh, this is the vendor EFT. So this is a vendor drafting your account. Uh, you just select the import file. You can see the AP EFT 060512 file. You specify the bank code, and it will spit out manual checks and create those entries for you inside accounts payable, all automatically. Last is the bill of lading uh, import. All you have to do is select the file from the dropdown. The import creates a batch of bill of lading holding the header and pickup information provided by Axis. Uh, that's all they provide. They don't, they don't give us the distribution side because they don't really know it. So what it does is it creates all the header or receiving information that you need, puts all the distribution or all of the products on the pickup, breaks everything down, gets all the right pickup points and all that, and then it puts that batch on hold. So then the operator just has to go back in and just say where it went. So they just have to go back and then do the distributions and you're ready to go. So it, it gives you that automated sort of entry to get rid of that uh, data entry errors that would may, be made during the bill of lading header entry. This takes care of that for you. So to recap, uh, with Axis, we have the fuel type, fuel tax, fuel price tables, the bill of ladings, the AR credit cards, AP invoice vendors, and the AP manual check vendor EFT. So that rounds out the Axis pieces and also rounds out the set of features for the 4.4.3 uh, release. So I know I've been going through it kind of fast. Um, I want to real quick just do a recap and mention the things we just talked about. Uh, first of all, we had the addition of the truck and driver fields to BO entry. So your operators can put the truck and driver in and then have that flow to history where you can actually then analyze that data. Remember that we set it up at the batch level and at the, the lading level, so it's pretty easy to work with uh, no matter how many different trucks and drivers you have. Um, the uh, bill lading date effective surcharges, this is the first of our enhancements to get freight to be a little bit, uh, a little bit easier to use, a little bit more intuitive. Um, that's the uh, being able to put multiple surcharges in with effective with effective dates instead of having it be just one with a particular vendor. Uh, freight in handles freight out cost of goods sold. That's getting that cost right into that freight item uh, so that you can get the real uh, your, any profit and loss you have on that freight inventory item itself for your gross profit. We added that freight based on gross gallons. So if you have a need for that where uh, you're in a particular region where you're charging freight based on the gross regardless of whether you're selling the product at net, uh, this feature is for you. The net distribution override, so being able to, for a specific bill of lading, flip a switch and have it not follow the, the settings in your, in your bill of lading product maintenance, but actually letting it go net-net just by you checking a box uh, if you have a need for that. The new Exxon Mobile Pegmos Stripes update. 
So that's part of the standard feature in the software. And we are, like I said, working on getting this rolled out uh, with customers who are using Pegmos today. The new sales so that, category that, field. That Sorry. feature, the ExxonMobil Pegmos, that, that is retrofittable. Customers Correct. don't necessarily have to upgrade to 4.403 to get that. Correct. And most of you have probably already been contacted about it. So let us know if you haven't you use Pegmos. Um, the uh, sales category field for sales debt, that's that piece where I was talking about share of wallet, new sales, or retain. Um, if you're thinking about moving forward with CRM, and I recommend you do take a look at it uh, with automating a lot of your sales force and your customer facing activities, um, that's, this is a great tool for that. Because as you're working through CRM and you've got sales plans and you've got forecasts, you can really see how you're doing. You know, if you're really, it takes you more than just how much did you sell, are you accomplishing your business goals with getting new customers, retaining customers, getting more of their business? Are you really, what kind of penetration are you getting? And with you guys, you know, it's all about, I mean, see what your competitors are doing, get, their, get those customers away from them and get them to come over to you. Um, it's just a tool to really look at your customer base. Even if you're not using a CRM or you don't have a CRM initiative, it's a great thing just to look at how you're doing as business and see if you're meeting those types of operational objectives you have. The addition of the ship time field to give you a little bit more granular control over how pricing is calculated. Um, I think that's a great addition and uh, we're very excited about that. And the new access interfaces. I do want to make a point that uh, of all of these things, um, for people who are actually upgrading to 4.4.3, uh, all the features are free and included except the, uh, the ExxonMobil Pegmos. If you're already a Pegmos customer, then you'll get this update. If you're buying Pegmos, that's an add-on. So I just want to say that you know, you, it's not part of the standard software. That is an add-on feature. And the access interfaces are an add-on. So those, you'll need to contact, if, if you're using Access or, or have interest in Access, you need to contact your sales rep and they can work with you on uh, getting those interfaces onto your system. And they are available if you are on any version of 4.4. So if you're on 4.4 later, you can get an access interface for your system. If you're on 4.3, we can work with you, but there'll be some there'll be some additional charges to bring it back to the 4.3 version. But if you're on 4.4, um, there's just some minor things. You have to buy the modules, and then there's a minor cost for the retrofit. So just, just letting you know. Chris, one other thing to point out with the access interfaces, you, you can buy those a la carte. So if yeah. you're just looking at the pricing interface, you can just purchase that. And uh, you can mix and match uh, any of those. That's a great point. And that applies to our DTN interfaces too. So uh, if you're using access or DTN, you can buy as much or as little as you want. Of course, uh, you, you know, you've got to look at your automation requirements and what you're trying to do, but you can buy just the pricing piece, or you can buy the pricing piece and the AP piece, or you can buy all of them, depending on where you are in your uh, automation of that process. So, absolutely. Right. That's it. Um, I, hope, I really hope you saw something to get excited about. We try and always add features uh, all over the software and, uh, and give you some things to do. We really wanted to focus in the area of freight this time around and really get some things done there and close some gaps that we had in pricing calculations and some of the gross margin calculations. We wanted to really beef that up and provide some new enhancements. All right, Tom, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, excellent job, Chris, thank you. Uh, well, for those of you who have attended our, our webcasts, uh, we've actually held a webcast every month uh, since, our, since uh, August of last year. Uh, this is normally the point where we would plug next month's um, webinar. We are actually going to be taking a break next August, or for August. We are not going to have a webcast. We are going to resume the webcast in September, and we've got a whole list of topics that you provided us with. September's webcast is actually going to be a continuation of the business intelligence webcast that we did last month. It's going to be entitled Business Intelligence Beyond the Basics and we're working on the content for that. We did receive a lot of input from the people that attended the, the Business Intelligence Basics webinar, so I certainly appreciate that, and uh, we're going to incorporate all that input into that webinar. I'll send out an invitation uh, about 30 days before it, so second week in August you'll, you'll receive an invitation for that. Uh, so just wanted to keep you posted on that. 
And then uh, we do have some questions, so uh, I think we've left enough time to get to them all, Chris. Okay. Uh, good timing there. The first one is from Kim over at Petrostar, and she is asking if we have release notes for each of the versions. And Chris, I can go ahead. And, I can go ahead and take that. We what we do we do have the release notes. Uh, we've been updating every time we come out with a new release. We've been adding uh, adding the feature list to that and kind of describing the feature as well as the benefit. And we do go back as far as our 4.05 release. So we do have that documentation available. If you want to just contact sales at sales at dm2.com, we'd be happy to send that to anybody who's interested in it. Next question is from Sean over at Interstate. Uh, he, he asked if he missed it, but do all the 4.4.0.2 enhancements come with the 4.403 release? They, they do. Um, some of them, so when we enhance our master's product, uh, we add all the functions. So what you saw in 4.4.2, 4.4.3 just builds on top of that. Um, so yes, all the dot two stuff is in with the dot three stuff. If you go to dot three, you'll get all the stuff from dot two, all the stuff from dot one, and all the stuff from dot three. Um, now, having said that, uh, I don't have the list in front of me, but a few of these things, like the consigned stations module, there is an additional fee if you want to purchase that particular thing. Most of them are free. Most of them are included with your maintenance. So you guys pay annual maintenance, and we include a lot of the stuff like the T6s, the bank reconciliation interface, those kind of things. But uh, in that particular case, the consigned stations module, there is a, an add-on cost for that. But yes, they are included with that version, with the newest version. OK, thanks, Chris. Uh, next question is from Sean again. He's asking if the freight in feature can be applied to internal customers to automate freight allocations. So this is freight in. So for the cost of goods sold to freight in. I believe I I believe that's what he's uh, asking there. Okay. So the freight uh, he in. He just responded. Free. He just responded yes. Okay. Um, it, if you're talking about internal transfers, not at this time, that would have to be a custom feature. This only applies to S-type transactions that are not distributed to internal customers. Now, that has a very specific meaning because when you set up customers, you specify whether they're internal or not. Without knowing your configuration specifically, um, I, uh, I would need to do a little, a little legwork, then we can do that to get back to you. So what, uh, what I'll have Tom do, Tom just make a note of that and drop me an email. And I'll, uh, I'll talk to somebody over in consulting and get him a response. Just as based on the, what I know uh, in how it's configured, it only applies to regular customer S types, not to internal. So uh, let, me, let me find out and we'll get back to you. Okay. I made a note of that, Chris. Thank you. Okay, the uh, next question is from Kim over at Petrostar again. She is asking, if the ship time can be updated when you import from MidCom. Can the ship time be updated? So you brought the transactions in to uh, invoice data entry from MidCom. Um, we would need to modify the MidCom imports, but yes, we could do it. If, if MidCom is providing us the time, then we could populate that, but we'd have to, we'd have to work with her on her MidCom imports. Okay, so uh, Kim, if that's something that you want to pursue, uh, you want to contact us about that. Yep. So if her right. her best course of action would be to contact professional services just through the regular channel and ask them about it, and um, and then they can put together a project and see see what's involved. It's pr I, I would say off the cuff, it's I'm sure really small. It's a pretty simple thing, um, but if you wanted to have some of this retrofitted to your, because this version obviously is just coming out. If you upgrade to this version, then we can deal with it during your upgrade. If you're looking for something to be retrofitted, then they can talk to you about that. So. OK. All right, the next question is from Sean at Interstate again. And he's, he's saying he knows he's looking a bit forward. But is there, do you have any rough ideas of what will be coming out in the next release, the 4.4.0.4 release? Um, we do have some ideas. Um, 
the uh, we don't usually talk publicly about our our new release features and functionality. Um, the uh, uh, we because it's such a dynamic thing, you know, those kind of things are constantly changing. Um, but I can tell you, uh, Tom, I'm going to drop off the screen for a second. Okay. So I'm going to stop. Let me know when my screen is not showing anymore. All right. Just dropped off. Okay. All right. Hang on just a second. Um, now, I want to tell you that this comes with a disclaimer about the size of a billboard. Um, <laughs> these are uh, things that we're looking at. Uh, but they're not, we haven't committed to actually moving them forward yet, but it kind of tells you where our heads are. Um, we are looking at improving and doing some things around the credit limits and the credit limits by aging and adding some new capabilities there to make it a little smarter about uh, how credit is applied and the different levels of credit. Uh, we're looking at adding some new price recalc features, uh, with smart logics interface. We're adding um, a new, fun new functionality around something called product movement. Smart Logics is a truck handheld automation system which handles the bill of ladings and the uh, distribution side both. And it's a fully automated solution where it populates all that information for you. Um, but uh, we're looking at adding some new capabilities there. We're working with ConocoPhillips to uh, add some new support for something called supplemental allowances. So we've been working with them on that. Uh, we're working with DTN on an electronic invoice upload. Uh, we're looking at uh, some new uh, inventory uh, analysis tools and inventory reconciliation, reconciliation tools for batch, uh, for geo batches and journals, uh, and then moving some things in our tax reporting up and taking a look at some some RINs capabilities. So it's kind of you know that's our our initial thing, but we actually have a meeting coming up here real soon uh, to discuss what we're really going to put in there. But those are the kinds of items we're looking at. Uh, we are very heavily focused at this point on our framework conversions. We have about half of our development programming staff working on that right now. Uh, and that's moving all of our stuff to the new framework and getting ready for a SQL back end. We're uh, next year going to be moving up to a level of, of Sage 100 that supports SQL as the database. So this isn't just a SQL interface. This is a live SQL back end. Uh, it's going to be a major update for DM2. Um, but uh, the, a lot of our efforts are being put there. So we're, we're doing these kind of little changes and enhancements as we go along, but that's kind of what we're looking at. All right. And to answer the question that's probably in your mind, no, I cannot provide you a written copy of that. So <laughs> more than welcome to watch the web or listen to the webinar again. <laughs> See if you can pick up some of that. <laughs> All right, Chris. All right. Well that is it for questions. Um, I just want to remind everybody that today's webinar has been recorded. Uh, the recording will be available in the next few days as soon as we have it posted to the customer content page of our website. I'll send a message around to all of our customers to let them know that it will be downloaded. Uh, if you can think of any other questions after the webinar ends, please feel free to email them to us at sales at dm2.com, and we'd be happy to follow up with you to get answers to those questions. I want to thank you again, Chris, uh, did an excellent job, and I want to thank everyone for attending today's What's New in 4.403 release webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Tom. That, that concludes today's webinar. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, Chris.